Hey everyone, today we got to speak with quite possibly one of the coolest people I've had the honor to speak to for these spear talks, Chief George Lapine. Just his background with the Okichikita martial art, the history, this is one of these talks that I'm definitely really proud of. And so I hope you guys really enjoy everything that um, George has to say. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone. I want to say a we're having a warm welcome to George here. Um, George, it's an honor to talk to you today. I do have a lot of questions about your background and the kind of the martial art um, that you kind of spearheaded. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, thank you for joining us today. You're very welcome. It's uh, it's a pleasure being here. And uh, as we would say in my language, uh, which means thank you again. How are you guys doing up in uh, Canada with all of COVID stuff and well, all that? Well, you know, yeah, so, you know, on, on a personal level, I mean, I'm pretty pretty busy with work and everything else. But, you know, unfortunately, the schools, we had to close uh, a lot of our training lodges down because of, uh, because of the pandemic. Because um, social distancing just doesn't happen in martial arts, as you know. So uh, that's been a bit of a challenge for us. So we decided to take a bit of a summer break. And, and you know, I'm a traditional dancer as well, like a powwow dancer too. So all the powwows and a lot of those ceremonial activities that we do in Indian country have been canceled. So it's a, for, for a lot of our, our community members, it's been pretty tough. But I'm sure the United States is going through the same thing. Um, you know, I dance with a lot of people and train with a lot of people from the U.S. as well. And so we're all kind of just kind of sitting back, letting this thing play out, and we'll take it from there. But, um, no, I, I've noticed, though, and I've been talking to some other friends and associates, it's like we're all kind of feeling quite healthy these days because we're not coming in contact with anybody uh, right. regardless. So it's uh, maybe it's kind of something that the creator wanted us to kind of have this purge, you know, with our health and our distancing to, to, to start replenishing, you know, Mother Earth again. One of the things I noticed when this kind of first broke out in March is the, the environment itself got so – with all the smog and the pollution, but you, they, the ocean started getting cleaner, yeah. the air started getting cleaner. So I think, like you said, it was a good reset Absolutely. Kind of for, our, for, our, for our people. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I originally, I just came back from my traditional territory out west. And so, you know, we're talking from Toronto here, but I'm, I'm from a territory about 2,000 kilometers away from here. But we, we were out there a little while ago, and you're seeing more deer up on the highway, small small game coming up onto the highway. They're walking right up because they're like, what are you doing here? And we're saying, what are you doing here? You know, and it's and the further you go into the interior, you're really starting to see a lot of those creatures and those animals coming out uh, at, at different hours. And the bugs, too. They're brutal. But, uh, you know, you're seeing those changes happening as well, where you normally wouldn't see animals coming in. They're, they're, they're right in, in space now. So it just shows you how much as humans we encroach in those territories. Right. So awesome. So let's kind of dig into your upbringing, where you're from, kind of what, how, what led you into your martial arts training. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm uh, First Nations, or as, as um, I guess our brothers in the United States use the term Native American. Um, we use the term Indigenous in Canada, First Nations. So uh, I'm originally from a place called Long Plains, uh, Manitoba. So it's about in the central part of Canada. So where North Dakota is, just straight up from there. Um, you know, I'm on the other side of the, uh, the U.S.-Canada border there, just a little further north. And I grew up in, in, in the Plains territory of Manitoba um, and, you know, really started getting involved in, in, in martial arts at the age of probably around 12 or 13 years old. Um, because I, I took an interest to it and just like any, any other passion, if you're, you know, you're passionate about it or you're very interested in it, you'll end up really start, you know, facilitating and getting involved in it. So that's probably where my initial pathway first started in, in martial arts. But I also come from a family of first responders, military, you know, I had two uncles that were traditional trappers. I mean, the guys that would go out in the bush, disappear for a year and come back. And wow. so, you know, I grew up, I grew up around that environment. So it's kind of a unique environment. And then we moved off our uh, reservation uh, probably when I was about 11 or 12 years old. And then we, my dad would always joke around. We moved from a small reserve to the largest one in Canada, which was Winnipeg. And so, yeah, so Winnipeg is um, a very large Indigenous population in the city of Winnipeg. I grew up in the North End there, pretty tough area of the city. And so there was, again, that thing of learning how to protect yourself, take care of yourself. And I had uncles and mentors around me that, you know, really, really showed me a lot of those types of skills. But I still had a great tie to the bush, so to speak. So, you know, it seems like every odd weekend, you're still going back up north and, and right. working in the communities and things like that. So 
you know, that, that was my interest in it, but also my interest was becoming, you know, a peacekeeper. You know, we use the term equamajijig, those who watch over others. And so I always respected that a lot when I was very young. And so I think that was also my pathway as well, getting involved in law enforcement and, and working as a, as a peacekeeper as well. So those things really, really drove my attention. Then also the need to make sure that, you know, you have a disciplined lifestyle and everything. And martial arts brought all of that. And, you know, I'm, I'm pushing close to 60 now. So back in those days, you know, your, your mentors were, you know, the Chuck Norris film or the old Bruce Lee films and things like that. So that was right. basically your first introduction to that form of traditional martial arts, unbeknown to me that as, as Indigenous people, we had our own form of, of uh, Aboriginal combat, so to speak. So it wasn't until I got a little bit older that I started really seeking more knowledge in that area. And, um, you know, I, I was in the United States throughout the upper U.S., uh, all over, you know, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Northwestern Ontario, looking at different things and seeing some documentation, talking to, to elders and traditional knowledge keepers and gaining the knowledge to start structuring, so to speak, or quantifying a system that would that we could call our own. When you started kind of reaching out to the elders, were they kind of taken aback? Like, what the hell are you, like, what are you talking about? Or how do you, because I assume a lot of this stuff is passed out to generations and stories. Absolutely. Yeah. So was, was there a written record or is this stuff that as it's passed down to generations that gets to you, you're like... Well, let's kind of put it all together and kind of create this system. Well, I, I, for, first and foremost, I was very clear not to convolute it or mix it in other traditional territories. So as I said, I'm from up the Midwest, so right. our treaty territory is Treaty 1. So I kind of kept it very much within that, that area. So if you look at the area that I focused on, it would be Manitoba, a little bit of Minnesota, down to North Dakota, just touching South Dakota, coming back up. And then we're going through Montana, a little bit of Alberta, across Saskatchewan. So it's almost like an oval right. like this in the plains. And so it was it was much easier when I was focused and I said, you know, I'm hearing these great things about Northwest combat, you know, or the Haida uh, in the Pacific. And I go, and, well, that doesn't apply to us whatsoever, because even when the horse was introduced, we weren't even really engaging in any conflict in, the, in that area. So I was very specific. And then when we moved to the woodland style, that's a different application of, of, of combat. And so... The plain style of combat is very quick. It's open territory. It's utilizing cover when available. And it, it was heavily tied to the horse culture from, from our perspective when I started moving forward. So getting back to your question of the elders, actually the receptivity was excellent. But keep in mind that I also had you know, a good 20 years of knowing, being known very well in the community before right. I started embarking on this, this pathway to, to seek some knowledge and guidance and, and, and obviously approval from, from the community. So, you know, that was done many, many years ago. So it was almost posed a question to me saying that, you know, we're not going to do it. You need to do this. You have the expertise in the, in, in the combative skills in the area. Then, you know, you've done the exercises. And I think a lot of that was that, you know, I wasn't reaching out for any type of reward or personal or monetary gain in this. It was basically saying we have a story here and it's very, very important that we keep it current because the unfortunate thing in our community is that a lot of those stories get lost. And, you know, when you mentioned of, of it being written down, we hear that term in our community about oral tradition and things right. of that nature, which is which is very accurate. But we also do have a form of documented process of our historical military campaigns and exploits. And a lot of this is captured on bison hide or other types of uh, lithograph applications and things like that pre and post contact. So a lot of that information is there. So taking that or taking a photograph of that, bringing it to a knowledge keeper and saying, can you explain this? Or I understand from this perspective, from a combative perspective, and I, and I lay it out and they're going, you're very accurate on this, but the guy's name is this. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, it was fantastic. So, <laughs> you know, having that experience just to be able to engage with those people has been, you know, one of the most beautiful things I've ever experienced. So judo or just the various other degrees you have, um, yeah. So, was, was there trepidation in kind of not taking from those to kind of create yours? Well, I, I think, and, and again, it's it's not so much of, of a creation. It's basically where does everything lay in the process of achievement, as we see it in any type of education or martial art, for example. You know, the the, the idea of going from white to black, so to speak, right? And so. Historically, our challenge has always been is that, you know, you find someone that's really good at this level and, and they're immediately moved to that achievement process where we, we don't have that in our society. So we've geared around the understanding of 
a person that's a white belt and a person that's a black belt. So I wasn't going to change any of that. But my experience with other martial arts, you know, I'm very open with this, is that I hold a fifth hand in Korean Taekwondo, WTF Taekwondo, a sixth hand in Taekuk Do, which is a form of uh, combat Hapkido, and I hold, I hold a brown in, in Judo. And so, you know, it was basically those martial arts, particularly my grandmaster from Taekwondo said, you know, um, you, you, you have these martial arts, you know, and, and the colonialism and the wars and everything that happened, you know, basically suppressed a lot of that activity. And I understood that. But he was speaking from an education and knowledge of what he was taught in Canadian and U.S. history, not necessarily from an Indigenous perspective. My Indigenous perspective on our history is very dark, and it's, it, it talks about the Indian Act and suppression, the potlatch law, and if you do this, you can be arrested. You know, there's, there's that side of it. So I had to harmonize those two and take a process, for example, in Taekwondo, where you have the different belt levels, right. and there's an achievement process. And that's what those other martial arts taught me, was that you can't just automatically, just because someone is good with a bow, or they're very good with wrestling, or they're good with striking, that, that they automatically go to that level. There has to be, you have to have the basics as well. And so, you know, all, for example, you know, every judo student, by the time they reach a certain level, they have to roll properly. They have to know how to break fall properly and those types of things. Right. So, you know, I, I look back at in our history it's that you wouldn't be thrown on top of a, you know, eight or nine foot horse galping at full speed without knowing how to fall off the damn thing. So, right. <laughs> you know, that, that, that process, you know, has to be taught into a system. So I had to do that through an indigenous perspective and constantly go back and verify the accuracy of it. And also go back to my territory to ensure that would this actually work here? Why would we do this here? Oh, because the ground is this, or that we utilize this waterway, or we would do this way. And so when you look at that martial art and you take it from to different territories, you go, like, yeah, they would have done something similar to that here, but they would have adopted this type of activity right. or weapon. So it's 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 very it's very um, I, I, I'll say it's very earthbound type of concept of understanding martial arts. You know, right. and it's an application of survival. So if, um, you know, I, I was a, a hunter and I, and I understand trapping and tracking and things of that nature. I mean, that, that was instilled to me in a, at, a, at a very young age. But I just think of those particular things I learned between the ages of, you know, 11 and 16, 17 years old. And could you take me and put me in a military unit with some freaking discipline and get me to go out in the battlefield at that age? Yeah, I could. And that's why so many Indigenous uh, veteran or veterans that are indigenous had no problem going right into the military right off the bat because they learned those ground skills at an early age, even before the average citizen, you know, right. those things. So, so if you take that from a historical perspective, practice those tactics and those techniques and then apply them to warfare, it's not a big challenge. The difficulty is understanding the, the, the importance of taking human life. And that's something that only is, is, is learned by the old ones that actually tell us the importance by survival and doing those things. So, you know, there was that concept of the martial arts structure that I really said this could work for Okichita, but at the same time, it's not going to stop us from doing what we want to do. Like, because some other martial arts will say, well, you know, you shouldn't be showing this weapon technique or you shouldn't be showing that. And the minute that you start doing that, you're saying you're changing everything that we did historically. And so it's, it's really important to me to ensure that when I'm explaining a technique in Okichita or an application, I'm saying, this is where this comes from. I want you to understand this. I want you to visualize this, even though that I haven't given you the weapons, but you'll see the weapons. Or I'd take a couple of senior belts and I'd say, this is what it looks like with the weapons. Now let go of the weapons. What are you going to do with your hands now? It's the same movement. So we're not trying to be, you know, you know we're not trying to be overly creative. Right. You know, Okichita. And, and, and it's just that, you know, nuts and bolts type of martial art that, that this is how it plays out. This is how it does. This is how it works. I think the importance of what we do is when we follow the medicine wheel, which are, you know, those four cardinal directions, the colors, everything's associated in the indigenous circle of how we work on that, is that some of the challenges are basically understanding the spiritual side. You know, I always tell my students, I, you know, uh, th that, you know, we are all a spirit having a human experience. And a lot of people think that we're all humans and we might have the odd spiritual experience. And the Indian way is actually quite the other way around, is that we're, we're all spirits and we, we're having a human experience. So we want to develop that human experience. You know? Do you think, because the, it, is, it is a very violent um, art, mm. and you do use weapons, is that, is, do you think that kind of 
hinders that you can't go more mainstream? I well, I, I think that's that's part of it, and also, I I think the idea is whenever you're involving any form of implement, whether it's a knife, an edge, you know, impact tool, firearm, you know, it, it changes the whole dynamics of control in the teaching environment. Right. So how can we teach something um, like Okichita effectively to younger generation without bringing this base cardinal violence in, in, into play? Um, and so there was things that we did historically that would prepare young boys to girls to some extent, but mostly it was boys um, to their application, what we call rites of passage. So that would start happening between the ages of 11 and 13 years old. And so what did they, what did they do to that point? Remember that uh, one of the easiest ways I explain this to some of my youth is that I say, could you take a knife and I'll show them a beaver style dagger, you know, something about that big. And I said, could you impale that in the bottom of deer, slice that up the rib cage, open it up and then remove everything. They're like, what? And I said, at your age right now, how old are you? And they go nine. I go, you were doing that at six and seven years old with your grandmother back then. So wow. by the time you reach the age of 16, 17, 18, you've seen everything. You really have, you really experienced everything. So, you know, and I think back to my own upbringing. I mean, yeah, I was, I was dressing deer and moose at the age of 16. 15, 16 years old. I was, you know, I hate saying it, but I, you know, I was clipping a leg off a small game and then after it's deceased in a trap line, you know, and you tell that to people that are living in the city, they're like, oh my God, but it was part of my, my growth. It was just a different way of growing up. So, these, I, so it's the balance of, of right. that experience and then putting it in our modern method and, and, and just about the story. I think what I'm seeing more now is a lot more indigenous youth coming forward as a result of their parents saying that we lost this. We want to make sure that our kids don't, right. uh, don't lose it or carry on these traditions. In these, the warrior society, what could a woman actually be a warrior or what, what, where did that make the switch where, you know, women can be badass or was it, was it like a kind of a cultural thing or. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, I'll speak from the, from the Plains perspective, particularly from the Plains Cree. We had a term that we called Al-Kuchitatawak of worthy men. And these were individuals that were identified within the community that had an elite status. I always tell kids nowadays, those are the guys that drove the Lamborghinis that the kids looked up to. That's who those guys were. And there was the odd woman in those, those communities. And a lot of times they were identified as two spirited. So they, they had, yeah, they had the fierceness of, of the warrior, but also you know, the, the flexibility and kindness of the feminine side, but they were directly, you know, in, involved in campaigns and, and warrior uh, activities, but frontline activities, not too often, not too often. They were there more like a support unit, you know, to, to, to help out. Um, you know, I was talking with a good martial art friend in Japan and they were talking about some of their female warriors that were there and they, they kind of almost spoke to them that they were, you know, um, they were part of the community, but they could never be a part of the community as right. a result of being a warrior. Kind of a unique statement. So I, I, I believe that we were kind of the same application. You know, nowadays we hear about woman warrior and we hear a lot of that activity, but right. also our society is very diversified now and it, it expands exponentially daily. But historically, you know, we didn't have that. And I'm very open about that because I, I say historically this is what we're doing. This is what right. we've done. But now we're adjusting to do that. So the demographics within any of our lodges is everything, you know, is everything. So, so Kichita, the war club, the Gunstock war club and the long knife are the two primary weapons you guys train mm -hmm. with, correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's cut, is there, can you give me kind of like a breakdown um, in terms of why those two weapons and specifically the, the Gunstock war club mm -hmm. in, in pop culture, my favorite movie is Last of the Mohicans. <laughs> so, the, the old father, Russell Beads, Chichka Cook, had the war club. And every time he used it, I was just like, man, this thing is so cool. But I just, I just thought it was, well, these probably put it together. Mm -hmm. And then as I'm researching your background and the, your martial art, I'm like, I had no idea this is part of, this is a cultural thing. This is something that generations have trained with. So I was just kind of blown away by that. Yeah. Well, in, in our language, it's called... Notine uh, Tone Mystic, which means Gunstock War Club. Now, the history from it um, came 
post-contact. And there's, there's a lot of different discussions on that, but it did come post-contact. And, you know, I've really done a lot of research on that and, and spoken with a lot of people of it. And it would make sense that, that it did. There are some weapons that are fairly close on the Northwest coast, uh, but they were actually more to do with uh, knocking out fish in the bottom of the war canoes. And they resembled very closely to the, to the war club, the Gunstock War Club, and it still could be used as a weapon. But the Gunstock War Club was primarily the use of it um, was it, it had several different applications. One is the, the resemblance of it. Um, and one of the things that we always say, and I teach uh, when I'm actually explaining this weapon, is that we used to be able to put a short battle lance along with it, and then we'd rest the gun stock on our arms. So it would look like we were armed with firearms. Right. Yeah. So because gunpowder and shot and, and firearms, for example, you know, were, were very hard to get. Uh, back in you know 17 1800s even 1600s impossible in the 1600s 1700s you start getting them 1800s they're, they're they're a little bit more available but they still cost a lot of money so but the gunstock war club is um when you really think about a, you know a large musket that's weighing you know quite a few pounds and once the shot goes out and you don't have a bayonet on the end of it the first thing you're gonna do when the people are charging in if you can't get your edge weapon or your impact tool out is you're gonna swing that gunstock around and the impact power of that weapon is significant, but the problem is it's slow, right? right? So, you know, we adopted to say, you know, we like the way this thing hits, we like the way it looks, but also we need something that can move a little bit faster. And so when you see it originally take birth in the East, you know, even in your area, you know, that's where a lot of it was, was shown. The weapon was much more of a one-handed weapon. It wasn't necessarily a two-handed weapon. And the ironic thing of Last of the Mohicans, the territory that it's played in, is the gunstock would actually have been smaller at that time. Because the gunstock that was in the plains is much larger. It's, it's much bigger. It's actually a two-handed weapon because it's much bigger. Right. So, and so, and again, think about the area that you're conducting the warfare in. If you're in woodlands versus open territory, you know, can you throw within 10 feet without hitting a tree? Right. Versus can you, can you actually wield, a, you know, a, a 30 inch uh, war club in an area that's got a lot of bushes and, and overhanging foliage, right? So you got to think of it again from a combat perspective. So the idea of this was to ensure that, you know, we looked at all the weapons of Okichita and we looked at what we've used historically, you know, the lance, the short lance, the battle lance, the, the coup lance, you know, which is the flag lance, the very tall one. You know, the knife, Mokiman, we call it, uh, Chikunakinis, which is uh, the tomahawk, <coughs> and the Notina Tonamisik with the Gunstock War Club. These four weapons in hand-to-hand -hand would have been utilized when firearms aren't available or they've already been discharged. So, you know, the firearm could be discharged. If you can't reload right away, you either sling it, drop it, and go right to your hand implements. And those, you know, if, what I do, this is a very easy example I do with when I'm teaching education classes, is I'll be with, whether it's, kids at elementary school or I'll do it at university level, I put these four weapons in front of them and I said, okay, now you got to deal with a guy like me, right? You don't know what I have on me. I, you got to grab one of these weapons. Which one are you going to use? And, you know, there's always the cocky guy. So I'm going to grab the knife or I'm going to do this, you know, and I just look at him and go, you're stupid. The first thing you're going to grab is the lance. It's the longest weapon. The guy's far away. You can impale him at seven feet away. Right. And you can, you know, you, you're, you're not, you, you can't swing all he wants. He's not going to hit you. So, the the um, the application of these weapons have different processes and you know proximities to your opponent. So the lance, the tomahawk, the war club, and then the knife. So for example, in hunting or harvesting applications, you're going to use a lance. You're going to use tomahawk to set up camp or an axe to set up camp and chop wood. The knife is going to be used for skinning or any type of work, whether it's hide work or anything else like that. But the war club is primarily and only made for warfare, only for warfare. And so you wanna, one of the things that I'll do is, as, as you know, North America, particularly Canada, the United States, is becoming a very diversified country. Both countries very diversified. So when we have these workshops, we'll have kids from all over the world that are now living in Canada. So one of the things that I do, which is pretty entertaining, is I'll hold up the knife and I'll say, in my language, we call this Mokiman. What do you say in your language? You know, I hear all these different words from all around the world, India, Pakistan, Germany, you know, all these different names. And I put the knife down and I hold up the tomahawk. And I said, in, in our language, we call this Chikuna Kinis. And then they said, it, what do you call it? And they say an ax or a tomahawk. And they go through all those different, different names. And I put that down. Then I pick up the lance and I said, we, in our language, we call this Chukukwan, 
what do you guys call it? And they called it spear and lance and, you know, that type of thing. Then I hold up the gun stock and the whole room goes puzzled because they don't know what to say. Because And I say, because this weapon was made in North America, right? So this right. is something to be really proud of, you know, as far as when we think about, you know, everything that's coming. It's, it's unique and it was pur purposely developed in North America for warfare use only. And then it, as it became um, older, it started becoming, a, a, you know, almost like a ceremonial and cultural significance that this weapon has been handed down to me through three generations and it touched our enemy back in the 1700s and it, it holds that spirit. So you see where that's going. That's the same thing as the pipe tomahawk. It had the same application. Right. So, so you know, that weapon, um, a lot of our movements are based on that. So why are our legs so far apart or whatever? So one of the easiest ones that I'll do and. You can just imagine doing this. You take a, a tomahawk that's one and a half pounds, okay? Like a rifle hawk or even even a trail hawk's not too bad. And I'll get one of the kids. I said, put your feet together, hold this straight out. And the first thing they wanted, their arm just comes down. I said, okay, now how would you hold this? And the legs go apart and everything. I take the tomahawk and I go, okay, go back. They'll stand in your fighting pose and the foot doesn't go out as far again. I give them the tomahawk and their foot comes out again. And I said, that's why we move the way we do because everything we do is generating, you know, a lot of centrifugal force as a result of a weapon that we have. And we're not technically gonna change that if we drop it or we lose it, because we know that in that engagement, we have to be as fierce as possible to be able to you know, finish up our opponent and then possibly pick up their weapon and use it on them, whatever. I mean, that's that's the idea behind it historically. So again, the Gunstock War Club, um, you know, the Tomahawk, for example, it's like, you know, it's like that term one shot, one kill weapon. You know, right. you get hit with it. I don't want to get hit with it, you know? No, like, right. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, it's, it's ruthless, right? And that's if you, that's it, once it impales, if you can get it out, that's the other thing, right? So, you know, it's a, it's a ruthless weapon. The knife, you know, for intimate quarters and, and throwing capability, same with the Hawk, you know, the, the, it's, it's a close proximity weapon, the Lance. You know, maybe I can kind of deke around it or I can get around it or a guy will swing it. And it's too much weight and I can counterattack. But that Gunstock War Club, it has everything from clearing, defending, you know, impaling, crushing, breaking, throwing, you know, all those applications are with the Gunstock War Club. It's so a very effective weapon. So I assume that's if I sign up for your class the first day, I don't think I'm touching that in a long time. That must be intermediate level training, correct? Yeah, and, and then also, like, for example, if you were to come in, we'd explain the movements and everything to get your, your psyche into that space. Because, you know, a lot of times we'll have guys from different martial art backgrounds come in, and sometimes they're the hardest to, to adjust to Okichita um, because, you know, they're, they're taught that their power is from the back, so the right leg goes back, where, you know, we want to put that power forward because the weapon's there. You know, my uncle used to say, you know, meet, meet metal or wood, not bone or flesh. Wow. Like, always let your opponent meet that, right? So... So um, that's always a bit of a challenge. But, the, you know, we do introduce it right away. You do have an opportunity to see it, to hold it, to experience it. And then, um, you know, we do have also, we hold some advanced classes that even if you're a novice, you're still coming in and you're learning the movements and things of that nature. A lot of the weapons, though, are sheathed, you know, to make sure that there's no edge issues. We use trainers for safety purposes. But all live, you know, all the tests and everything for senior, but all done with live weapons because you had to respect it. So you have to understand that that thing, if you do it wrong, you're going to do some damage. So you're learning it right away. And I find that I always keep the weapons on stage, you know, kind of like in a, in a preparatory manner so that I see something in class going on. I'm going, okay, I got to bring this out and I bring it out. And, you know, I could have, you know, I have a couple of students that are heavily into jujitsu, for example, and I love it. You know, it, it's great watching them because, you know, we have some of our own wrestling, but again, it was a, an application of, of finishing out and moving. It wasn't about trying to choke a person out. And so I'll just basically say to a couple of my other students that are there, I said, what do you do right now? And they said, well, we're just going to crush him in the head with this. If he's holding my friend, if he's holding my friend, I'm going to hit him in the head with this. And it kind of makes them think about it. I said, that's the difference between combative and competition. And I said, you know, our competition was our, our skillful art on, on the, what we did as uh, individuals, but the, 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 there's no competition in combat with the exception of counting coup. Yeah. If I'm walking down the street with that in Canada, is that kind of like holding a pocket knife or is that considered a, like a samurai sword, like weapon where you can't be in public? Well, no, we, you know, we, we make sheaths and everything else. They go into, into bags and everything else like that. I mean, even the lances, I mean, the heads pop off. I keep the, you know, the shafts at, at the school and things like that. 
Um, one, one of the things that I do do though, because, because I do work in the law enforcement community is that I give every one of my students a card and I said, keep this in the bottom of your backpack. So when our law enforcement partners end up searching you, they'll be able to know that, uh, you know, you're, you, what you're doing is legitimate, but yeah, we don't, um, you know, if we do have any classes that we're doing outside and we're going to be using indigenous weaponry or whatever, we do it in a group form. It's very controlled. It's managed well. Everything is closed back up again and then moved on. You know, some of the camps that we have, there's no one around, so it's not an issue. Right. But you're right, man. In an urban center, you know, we got to be we got to be really, really careful, right? What is your belt system, or like, how do you go up in class? Is it just taking a, a, a class and keep going up different levels, or how do you yeah, structure so, it? So we always, you know, I think I think uh, you know nowadays, if you if you stuck out at every taekwondo class and went to school three times a week and passed every promotion test, you could be a first dan in like two years, like a, you know, even less. I heard in some places, but. But Okishita, it probably takes you about three and a half, four years to start getting to, to black. So again, we follow the medicine wheel. Um, you know, originally I, I was going to actually follow our colors on the medicine wheel, but it would be, it wouldn't be bad for non martial art community, but we'd be bad for the martial art community because it would look like we actually went down in rank as we went higher. So to give you an idea on the Eastern doorway, we use the color yellow, the Southern doorway, we use the color red, the Northern doorway, we use the color white. And the, the the western doorway where we're from is is blue, and sometimes you'll see it in black. But in the plains, we use the the color blue. So originally, we thought we go you know yellow, red, white, blue, and it just messed everyone, and then go to black, and it just it was just messing everyone up. So what we decided to do was just to say you know you're going to be kind of in a probationary period, you know, with the white for a little while, and once you're once you're comfortable, then you move, move to red, and so. The idea of the red is that you're you're actually you know you understand the weapons you understand the movements you're getting a little bit better and then the next movement from there is red black and then the last movement is black so there's only four belts yeah there's only four belts but they take a long time on each no, one i love yeah. that and yeah. so is there a way for the, your students or even yourself to compete against someone else or obviously because of the way it's set up with the weapons it must you can't kill someone no, and, and we've been asked before, but unfortunately, you know, we're, you know, I teach students to, to survive and prevail. So it's not so much about, you know, the competition side. And I think that if they applied a lot of those techniques, particularly say in a, in a competitive format or UFC format, for example, that it just wouldn't fly elbows to the back of the head, right. gouging the eyes, swift kick to the groin, and then jumping and, you know, <laughs> Jumping off the cage, for example, and tackling someone in a headlock and smashing their head into the floor, like they just would not permit that type of stuff. So it's not saying that we, we couldn't do it, but you know, it's almost like when you think of the Kumite, which is you know not right. really allowed anymore, it's like, you know, would we be allowed to do any of that stuff? That's the other story. The competition form for us is is accuracy and our throwing skills. So those would be the skills. So the throwing of the gun stock, the throwing of the tomahawk, the throwing of the lance, archery, knife throwing, things like that. Those are the competitive skills um, that we kind of, you know, play into. We don't really get involved in, um, you know, international knife throwing contests or anything else like that because we use um, <clears throat> a term called um, pimpata, which means to the, the the application comes from pakama, which is counting. It's the idea of, of throwing with the intent to harm or to kill. And so competitive throwers are very precise, almost like darts, where they throw that way. And ours is basically to take that item down. So we've been known to, you know, we have relationships with different ranges throughout Canada. And a couple of here in Toronto, we've, we've gone in with our students. And I, I prepay in advance because I know we're going to destroy <laughs> everything. And so, you know, we go through boards like crazy, but, but that's about the closest we get to competition. And I, and I always say that true competition is, is fighting, you know, that, 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 uh, the challenger within you, you know, that's the most important thing. So that, that'll give you the challenge. Maybe I'm not strong enough. Maybe my cardio is not good enough. I need to, no one's like, you know, even I'm learning at my age, you know, and, you know, I have my good days and my bad days, you know, where I'm throwing, I'm going, why did I even pick this up today? And other days I'm on the mark, you know? So it's just like we're constantly learning and your your true competition is yourself. That There's no doubt for that. So what is the toughest thing for you as a teacher? I'm sorry? What is the toughest thing for you as a teacher? The toughest thing? As a teacher for you. What makes it difficult for you to be a teacher? Uh, I, I, you know, like I, I think the, the, the difficulty is re-educating people that think they know about our history. 
Um, and some people don't want to hear, you know, what the Indian Act did to us as a people. Right. But I think it's important for them to understand some of this history so they can appreciate where we're coming from, from Okichita. You know, John, I mean, like we, we had many, many issues. I remember growing up as a young boy and I remember being along the Assiniboine River in Manitoba, walking with my uncle. He picked up a piece of driftwood, you know, just a silver piece of driftwood. And he starts speaking to me. He goes, what be? He starts talking to me and he starts saying, look at this. I had a nickname, Wapi. So he, he, he'd say, look at this. looks like one of our old, like a war club. And I'm like, look at him. I'm going, what are you talking about? You know, hockey teenager. What do I know? Right. And so he was saying, you know, he started giving me a bit of a history on that. And he's moving it around and showing me a couple of movements and pretty cool stuff and everything. And then some people are walking by having a cigarette on the top of the path. We weren't on, uh, on traditional territory. We were in a city. And so we were just walking by one of the rivers. So he sees them. He just throws it in the water. And then I kind of went like, why'd you do that? I wanted that. Right. Cause my, my cool uncle was just doing some stuff with it. I wanted now it's way the frick out in the river and it's going away. And he says, you realize that if I show you any of this stuff or anyone, or, you know, if I show you this stuff, you should realize that I could actually still get arrested for this, you know, and uh, I'm thinking that's in the seventies. Okay. And so to give you an idea the Indian act in Canada, and I, and I, and I apologize. I'm not totally familiar with a lot of the legislation in the United States because of right. Indian affairs, but in Canada, the Indian act was initiated in the 1800s, just after a huge battle that my family was involved in the Northwest rebellion, right. In the, in the, in the Midwest. And so the Indian act was, was there to try to abolish and simulate indigenous people. And, and the idea was it, it had different areas in the legislation that allowed you to initiate regulations that could stop native people from doing certain things powwow ceremony potlatch giveaways okichita was there not identified okichita but cultural practices any any type of combative thing it was identified so it was against the law you could be incarcerated and remember this is coming from a time when we were still hanging people up here you know right so, yeah so so um and the war just happened you know cypress hills massacre happened like there's all kinds of stuff that was going on so once that was initiated it didn't actually get rescinded. That section didn't get rescinded till after this, uh, just before the Korean War, around the Korean War. Jeez. And that was because the Allies uh, saw what the Germans did with the concentration camps. And then this was the League of Nations that started, which originally became the United Nations. A little history lesson I'm giving here. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. And, and basically what happened was they said that all countries have to look within themselves and see how they're affecting human rights. And that's when they decided in Canada to say, we need to kind of rescind this. But keep in mind, they didn't do it till the 1950s. My uncle in the 1970s still thought he could get arrested. So this is, this is the problem, is that, you know, you, you push this on people so much, they believe that it, it'll never change. And so, um, you know, when I started building the system and structuring everything, we had a huge event here in Canada, which was the Oka crisis. And that w that had to do with Mohawks, and I'm not related to the Mohawks at all, but related to the issues, is that they basically had a private corporation that wanted to build a golf course on ceremonial burial grounds. Think about how much that would have set you, like you know. And so they were going to build this golf course there, and the Mohawks went, "No, you're not," and they put this big blockade, and the Canadian military was involved in everything, and just a huge blow up of of issues between Canada and ind Indigenous people. And right at that time. I made a decision. I said, okay, enough's enough. I'm going to start moving forward on this. And then they had the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. They had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, all these different things kept identifying that cultural practices should not be stopped. And if anything, they should be endorsed by the government of Canada. And so those were the early years of me really pushing forward and saying that I'm, I'm going to make this stick and I don't care what anyone says in, you know, outside the community, we're going to, we're going to be doing this. So, you know, that's, that's uh, the big challenge. And, you know, I, I, I rubbed a few elbows a certain way, but at the end of the day, you know, we were here and this is what we did and we're going to continue doing it, you know, of course in a safe fashion, but. Right. You but you, you took that oppression and that hatred towards the indigenous people and kind of put it towards, like it's an interesting dichotomy, you, the violence mm -hmm. of what you actually do, Okichita, mm -hmm. but there is that, the violent part of it, but there's also the, Behind the violence is our history and our stories and our culture, and I, it, it's it's very fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's a form of reconciliation, isn't it? You right. Know, when you when you look at it, so you know, I'm very open. You know, I always get asked, you know, how many do you ever take non-indigenous people? I go, absolutely, I take everybody. The idea is to share our story, 
right? And, you know, I learned something from the elders and I carried it to the very day is that, you know, we have a saying, give me knowledge so I may have kindness for all, right? right. The more knowledge I can share with people, the more kind people will be to each other. And if we can do that one person at a time, then we're doing our job. We're doing our job. So it's really important. So right now, it's very hard with the pandemic not to be able to do that. Right. You know. In 2002, you guys are heading towards the World Martial Arts um, Festival. So was there any, because you guys are doing the demonstration for that, yeah. to basically say, hey, this is what Okishita is. Yeah. Leading up to that, was there any fear where you're going to be rejected or you're kind of like, you know what? We got to go through with this. Well, I, I, I think there was a lot of preparatory time before that, that event. Remember, that was just after the events of 9-11. It was supposed right. to happen before that as well. And just the world was upside down. So we, we couldn't really go where they wanted us to. The event was unfortunately canceled that year, too, because of 9-11. So we were just building back up again. But we didn't really no because we were confident in what we were doing. And what was great about the World Martial Arts Union, we're a part of that as well, is that it really recognizes martial arts from all over the world. And, and so there was not too many organizations that were really out there doing that. Particularly, you know, at all, everyone was saying, well, this is KTF, this is WTF, this is KTA, this is, you know, everyone had their own organization. And even individuals that were probably doing those martial arts may, might've been outcast as a result, they weren't accommodating the Federation or, or something like that. So that was a challenge. So what was great about Wolmao was that they, we're really out there actively seeking these unique martial perspectives from around the globe. And so right. I felt quite good about it. I think what it was is that their perception of how a native warrior should do it and how they should look probably didn't make up to their expectations um, because, you know, they're picturing, you know, uh, Russell Means <laughs> or Magua in last right. running with a knife and a sword with, you know, my shirt off and, uh, you know, doing, doing that type of thing. And so it's like, you know, the balance of the old and the new. Um, but again, uh, the appreciation and the respect that we got from them was, was fantastic. You know, it was fantastic. My, uh, again, like I love Last week it's actually my Instagram handle is, has Magua in the title. And <laughs> I've, I've always been fascinated by the culture. So I guess my question, historically, I don't think Hollywood has done it. They've almost too made it too Hollywoodish. Some mm -hmm. of these movies. Mm -hmm. Do you watch some of them, or do you? Or what movie or show do you think depicts the indigenous people in the most authentic way? Well, Last of the Mohicans is is very good. Uh, okay. I, yeah, it's very good. It's um, it shows uh, you know uh, a couple guerrilla applications how a unit would be attacked. Um, if I recall. Was it one of the general's daughters or both her daughters yeah. were on that one thing and the, the way yep. they attacked, you know, the 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 um, incursion or the, the secret of incursion into that unit. I, I can't speak to that. But, you know, I just I just look at the applications where there's a volley of fire. Everyone takes cover and then they go in and react before they can actually reload and how, you know, the British would actually have second lines of fire and things like that. And basically, that's what how they eventually won combat engagements. But the physical applications, the movements, absolutely. It's, it's very, very accurate. And, um, you know, if I look at other films, there's the odd thing. And then there's the corniness, you know, the absolute corniness of it. And, and it just, I just shake my head and I'm going, you know, I don't know. I'm just not happy with that. <laughs> but there's other areas where I remember, I think it was Jackie Chan and Shy Hat. Shy, Shy Hat Do. Shy yeah, where, yeah where, Shy Hat Do. Yeah, where yeah. they throw the hawk at him and then he catches, he throws it back and then they throw it back at him. Like stuff like that is fantastic because, you know, we would have been doing that with our cousins, like throwing shit back and forth at each other. Right. So, you know, it just makes sense. You are right, though. I think Hollywood really needs to understand, you know, and really get the right people um, in front or behind the camera that can actually really accommodate the truth and the validity of a lot of this, even though it's not fancy. There's nothing wrong with it. Just, right. like, hey, he's done, man. I put it in him. He's done. Like, right. you know what I mean? So, but the problem is, is that everyone wants that spectacular, you know, Hollywood, you know, Kung Fu drama, like on, on right. the films. And I it, don't get me wrong. I love watching it too. I love the, uh, <laughs> the athletic capability of some of these people. But at the same time, you know, I remember being at one event and someone said, oh, Kimakon, you know, what would you do if a guy flipped like that? I said, I just put this in him. 
like end of story. He's flipping at me. I'm just going to throw this in there. Whatever. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's all I'm doing, you know? Just no different than a person that's very good at tactically shooting, you know? He's not going to sit there and try to do every little skill. He's just going to aim and fire, you know, two rounds and drop it, like, you know, and just very good at what they do. So we're no different. But the, the thing with Hollywood, I think, um, you know, need, needs to change. We actually have some productions that we do have coming up. Oh, awesome. Which are, um, uh, we're redoing a couple films in our in history, um, but we're putting a modern spin on it. And Okich Shaw is playing a big part of it as far as mentoring uh, some troubled youth in the film. So we're, we're looking forward to that. One of my, and I don't want to keep going back to the movie, but last yeah. week it's, they, the three main characters are basically run through there. They do like these judo tosses. They throw the guy on the ground. They pull out the long knife and it's a quick kill. And so immediately as I started researching Okichita yourself, I'm like, wow, I've been watching this since the 90s. I had no idea that that very aggressive, yet quick, efficient, nothing yeah. fancy. And I think that's what I really respect about Okichita. Like the, mm -hmm. There's just something really raw and aggressive about it. Mm -hmm. But there's that backside of just, I need to survive and I need to move forward. And I love that. Well, you know, I, I see a lot of clips all the time of, of law enforcement officials, you know, kind of hesitating or not draw, you know, kind of like relying on too many implements to be able to really do the tactic. And there's certain things physically that you can do to be able to shut down a situation very, very fastly. But unfortunately, it's just not readily accepted in society. Right. And then that's that's the challenge is that it's better to have a constable or a police officer injured than to be able to take that chance of, of having them possibly do something that's so aggressive that it offends the public, you know? And that's what but, we're doing in America right now. Like there's yeah. very, like you can't, for me, being prior law enforcement in the security field, yeah. I know a lot of brothers and sisters in the law enforcement that are afraid to kind of do their job, what they're yeah. trained to do to be a yeah. survivor and yeah, a warrior. That. And they can't, they can't do it because they're afraid of the media or they're going to get sued. It's like, there's a, it's a weird, um, it's a, I don't know how you, if, if you're teaching law enforcement, how are you, what is your thought process mentally helping them? What are you telling them? Well, I, I think, I think there's got to be, you know, some very good tactically communication between the subject and the individual. And then there's a drawing line, right? There's a point where you're just going, well, I can't return from this. So we move forward. Right. How many, how many times does a teacher have to ask you to put down the pencil? You know, it should only be once. You, you know what I mean? And right. so when I was growing up, I'm telling you, man, I've, I've done my share of breaking yardsticks over my backside, I'll tell you. But, but you know, it's just a, a, a different world. I, I, I guess, you know, one of the things that we do some work, but we actually do a little more work with military than we do with law enforcement because the stuff that we do is more kind of military based on some of the edge things that we do, like the edge right. tactics and the sentry removal, how to sneak up, how to track, you know, that type of thing. So it's more of a, a military side. We help law enforcement in areas of understanding knife culture and things like that. But again, it's very hard when you're, you know, working day in, day out, putting your kid on, taking a kid off and, and all constantly uh, having the legislation advocated at you every day. Like you got to follow this rule. You got to do this law. I got to do right. that. Like I, you know, I, I was a first nations constable years ago, you know, tribal police officer in the United States is the equivalent. You know, when I worked back out on the prairies and up northern Ontario and, you know, parade, you know, we our parade would basically be either a phone call or we'd be in the detachment or hanging out in a parking lot with the cars like this and talking to each other. I could I could you imagine being on a parade now with a police officer like as oh. a police officer in Minneapolis right now? Or, oh, you know, it'd be terrible. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, it'd be terrible. Like you're just sitting there and you're going, you're just like this. You're like, why am I here? You know, and a lot of these guys have a good heart. They're there to, you know. To protect the public and they believe in what they're doing but you're taking that whole belief right out of them now with with the challenges and the and the barricades that are going up for these poor fellas you know right it's very hard so yeah so i i think you know on our side you know with the the aggressiveness and everything i really really you know push into the students the belief is that you have to have the discipline to know that if you cross that line you're totally accountable to your actions because there is no recovery like once you decide to initiate that and, and get so good at your action that you scare yourself. That's the way I was taught. So, right. you know, if you throw that, okay, and you understand, do you understand what will happen is if you initiate this force against another human, okay? It's a difference between being on one side of the bars or the other. And, and so, you know, I preach that as well, especially to our youth, because, you know, that frontal cortex ain't developed till they're 25. So you gotta, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta make sure that they know they're, what they're doing. You are right, though. The articulation, just because you could 
use the war club, the minute you pull it out, you're ready to use, you better get ready to use it. And so mm-hmm. your actions, mm-hmm. there's, I think a lot of times people get, whether it's especially with firearms, like, oh, I can own a gun, I can, but do you know how to use it? Do you know yeah. how to respect the weapon? Yeah. And if you do have to use it, be, be pull it out. Just don't wave it. You better get ready to pull the trigger. Yeah. Due to the consequences. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 no different than you know being in uniform, right? So when you put that uniform on and you go into work, your your mindset is there, right? You're there on, on that mindset. It's the same way as a martial art uniform. When you put your martial art uniform, have your training implements. You're within the training lodge or you know the facility that you're working out in. You know your your headspace is there. But when you pack all that up, there's a part that is still with you, but accessibility to those things may not be available. So have you trained to a level where you can't, you don't, you can't use these, you know? And I alluded to the fact that I go, okay, you've been trained all this, all this activity, you know, tracking, you've been through ceremony, you've done knife work and all these different things. Now you're a hostage. Now you're literally, you don't, you don't have access to any of that. And you're going to have to defend yourself exactly what you have on your body and in your hands and on your feet right now. And so that, that changes everything. So I do that with the guys once in a while too. It's I'll take them out and I'll just say, okay, what are we working on today? And we're going to go get our stuff. I'm not, I'm not getting anything. You're going to find something that make you survive here right now. Man, I love that. So, yeah. So, you know, I've had guys come back with sticks, guys come back with rocks. You know, I had one guy that came back with uh, uh, a bone of a dog he found. <laughs> like a dead dog, he broke the bone of the rib cage. He had that. I'm like, fantastic, you know, but... It's basically you have to think of it like you're you're now you're now the the, the prey, right? And so, and so how would you survive in this circumstance? You don't have access to any of this. So, you know, I think a lot of martial arts don't do that. They right. they kind of build this false sense of security that basically, well, you trained really hard and now you've got a black belt and you know you can go out there and you're fine. And it, it's not the case because they have to learn how to make that mindset move right across all those parallels, right? It's really, really important. I even see this from law enforcement guys. They, they shut off as soon as they get out of work. You know, that type right. of thing. Yeah. Earlier, you kind of talked about the medicine wheel and the four directions. Mm-hmm. But kind of piggybacking on that, yeah. what exactly are the grandfather teachings? Well, yeah. So, so it depends on, on where you are across Turtle Island. We call it Turtle Island, North America. Um, but, you, you know, everyone always seems to get love and respect, you know, bravery, integrity, humility, truth wisdom you know these are the 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 different teachings of of the grandfathers and all of them um you know are applied on a daily walk of us as humans um whether we're doing okisha we're doing anything uh or raising our families regardless doing work you know values and ethics are all built into those teachings so it's very much the same as when you think of the martial art code of you know like the commandments of martial arts and things like that it's very much like that but this applies a little bit more on a, on a spiritual and a ground level. So we always say that there's four powers of creation. There's Mother Earth, obviously, you know, grandfather, uh, son, grandmother, moon, and our ancestors. And so what's really important about that fourth power of creation is the ancestors is that they were here before us. They've taught us so much. Don't forget what they taught us. And we have to carry it on because one day I'll be an ancestor. And so those are part of those grandfather teachings is that they have the connection to those four elements, not just the one say love. Okay. Well, yeah, I love that. It's not about that. It's, do you understand the application of love? You know, the, the commitment of it, the, right. the understanding of loving another creature, loving your enemy, for example, you know, we, in El you know, we have, our, we've changed our saying to accommodate our modern uh, philosophy as a result of, you know, who we are as a people, but historically, it was basically said this way, make my enemy strong, courageous, and brave, for if I defeat him, I will not be ashamed. And the idea behind that is that I never want an easy fight. I want something hard so that I learn from it. And so basically, that was, you know, a warfare saying, and how do we adopt it to today? It's a challenge. That challenge could be school. Challenge could be a relationship. That challenge could be addiction. That challenge could be financial. And so we adjusted it to do the same thing, but made it a challenge instead of an enemy because it, it, it is difficult. So those grandfather teachings are applied through that process as well. And, you know, I talk about the spiritual side, you know, with Okichita, no one grades to black belt unless they've gone through a, uh, a warrior sweat lodge ceremony, right? And the sweat and lodge, what's that? Okay, the sweat lodge ceremony is basically, we call it our church. That's the way the grandfathers call it. And the sweat lodge ceremony is basically, you know, imagine like people say, oh, it's like a sauna. You go, no, it's not like a sauna. 
So it's the point where I can't even do this to my skin and it hurts so much. Like, you know, it's just the temperature that you want. You can't see your hand in front of you. And basically the regular sweat is usually there's a round, um, round we call a round of, of songs and prayers for each individual. And then the lodge is closed. So there's a fire pit that's built into the ground. Grandfathers are a sin, we call them, which are stones that are heated stones. They're baked between four and six hours at a very high temperature. They're almost red when they're going into the pit. And then they're slid in. Uh, water's put on them, they're dressed off, the water's put on them, and then the, the heat starts coming out of those grandfathers. And so we believe that the oldest creature on the planet is the rock. And so that's why we call them our grandfathers, because they're, okay. they're older than everybody. So, you know, so the, the warrior sweat is, we've made it four rounds, but the actual warrior sweat is seven. So some of my, seri my serious uh, students that are trying to push higher levels in Okasha, I make them go through the seven, seven uh, round sweat, which is very painful. You're, and you do it with them still. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great way to purge everything. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Yeah. But we're not doing any of that right now with COVID. Right. I mean, maybe that's what just would kill COVID. We all yeah, do that. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So in a perfect world, where do you see yourself in Okuchita in like five years? Is this something you want to keep? I mean, I think for you, for me, learning about this, I want to tell so many more people about you and what you're doing, and I think it's important. But for you, how do you kind of, how do you push yourself to get better every day, and then how does that kind of affect Okichita? Yeah, well, like you know, I train, I train for you know several purposes. <clears throat> One to, to stay in good shape. Two to be battle ready at any time. You know, I kind of think of it that way. And then three is that I don't teach anything I can't do myself. I live by that code. So I can throw just as good as anyone. I can launch you. I can flip you. I can throw you. I can punch you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I just, right. I, I just live by that code. And, and the thing is, is that, that I, you know, wouldn't teach anything that I, I couldn't do myself. So by, by, by that philosophy, you know, I'm trying to maintain that energy so I can do this for, for years to come. And the idea now is for us is to, to start sharing this on more of a real global platform, you know, you know, versus the web and, doing things like that. You know, we got a feature coming in a couple of big magazines, awesome. big things in a little while. Um, and so, you know, that's exciting stuff. And then to get into mainstream media, that would be the, the big thing. So to be captured somewhere in film um, where, you know, we just have a snippet in there just to basically no different than what, you know, Jeff Speakman did for Kempo, right? You know, just a little, right. little thing there. And I, I think that that's one of the ways that it's a little bit easier for us to get, get, get spoken out there. You know, I'm going to continue training, going to continue teaching, you know, the next, you know, I can, I can retire between three and five years from my regular work. And, you know, I just look at teaching worldwide, doing plat, um, different types of workshops and things like that. Yeah. That's where we're, uh, I see us going. And how important is fitness for you? And then obviously for your martial art? Well, fitness is quite important. Um, I, I always tell students too, is that I'm not here to get you fit, but you better be fit when you finish class. Right. So, yeah, like, you know what I mean? So, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're all, we're all susceptible to injury and, and discomfort and pain. Um, it's just the human experience that we're going through. So, you know, if, if you come in with the intent to say that you want to get in shape just with us, then I'm saying, well, you need to do that elsewhere as well. A comp, like you need to support your Okacha training and make sure that you're doing stuff outside of here as well. Because, you know, we just don't have people like we did historically. I mean, I mean between you and I, I'd love nothing more to live on the land and, and to right. do this seven days a week. But it just doesn't happen, right? So, you know, we have jobs and family and financial obligations that we need to support. So, you know, how do we do it piece by piece? And the idea is that, you know, yeah, we'll train you. We'll do that. We'll do the workouts. But, again, it's, you know, we cut and then we just get right into the martial art techniques. <laughs> and sometimes some people are used to that because... I'll have students that'll come in, they're stretching and all that. I'm going, hey, you're going to do that before, you know, you get on the horse and you'll go a thousand meters to take out your enemy. No. Like, dude, they're just going to jump on there and go for it. And if you're sore right now, you can't do that. Then you need to go get a little more conditioning to make sure you can do it. Right. Right. So, but I, I believe in, in always being ready and, and just, and like I said, preparedness. And so conditioning is an important part of that. And also it doesn't have to just be weight training or it doesn't have to just be cardio. Are you happy? Are you comfortable with what you can do? Can you execute this technique in your current state. If you can't, you need to condition around that. That's the way I look at it. So, you know, I got some students that are, you know, really good shape. I got other students that aren't in shape. I got other ones that are just learning how to exercise. You know, we got them all across the board, but they're all there trying. One of the things that I do that is quite unique is that we actually do what we call pow powwow warm up. And because I'm a traditional dancer, I was a grass dancer when I was much younger. And grass dancing is super fast. 
I mean, that beat is just hauling when we're doing it, right? Right. So, and every time that beat would go down, your foot would have to touch the ground. So now I'm a traditional dancer and the beat's much slower, but at the same time, we have people that are coming from outside our community that are learning about the culture and what a better way to do it through dance and music. So a lot of times what I'll do is when I'm doing the warm ups in the class, we have these different hoops. There's like 30 or 40 hoops around the room. Everyone is stepping in, stepping out, learning all these different powwow steps and learning and appreciating and understanding the songs. And I have students that are professional singers and drummers and everything for, for uh, uh, indigenous music and stuff like that, that are artists. And they share their, their stories with the students after the class or post-class, you know, like it's great to see that it, it really becomes a family. So before I let you go, kind of, if someone wants to reach out to you or read more about uh, Wapichita or your classes, where can they kind of reach you? Are you on social media and all that? Yeah, so we, you know, you just have to look up the, the term Okichita, uh, O-K-I-C-H-I-T-A-W. Um, yeah, just look that up and there's all different types of streams, Instagram, Facebook. Yeah, you know, I have students running stuff across uh, Turtle Island, uh, our website as well. Uh, like I said, there's some magazine stuff that's coming out uh, as well. And we also have a video series that people are available to, to, to stream as well. You know, all these things are available that are out there. So it's great right now that you have accessibility. And I think that's probably why Okachita is coming out more is because of all these platforms weren't available to us 20 years ago. Right. Yeah. It's, so, the, it's a necessary evil, I guess, if it's yeah. used, used to the yeah. proper. As, right. as you know, when I was teaching a lot of these techniques, even in the 80s when I was doing some of this stuff, it was just local guys popping in and seeing me or doing it in the backyard or on some land somewhere. And no one knew about it. Like, no one talks about it, you know. So now that we have, you know, all these different platforms, they're, they're great. You know, and once things start loosening up, we'll start doing different workshops. We'll post that. Uh, you know, a lot of them are, are in Canada or upper U.S. Um, right. You know, we do stuff foreign. Was wild. Like this year, we were supposed to be in Singapore. We were supposed to be in Poland. Um, oh, wow. and we had, yeah, we had another one in Vancouver. All of these were canceled as a result of COVID. So, yeah, and then we were supposed to be in Korea next month, and that's not happening either. So it's just the... Uh, 2020 is a bust and uh, 2021 we're going to bust our ass. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you, George, for the time. And yeah. uh, I wish you all the success and thank you for sharing your story. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah thank you. And, and much success to you too, as well. I think you're the idea that you're doing on the, on the, uh, you know, the, that, uh, that week is going to be awesome. Be really yeah. Great. We're trying to just get as much out there. Cause a lot of times for me, I was just like, Oh, judo, jujitsu, karate, but you, but then you start getting to the specific French kickboxing or mm. Okichita or there's some other like even yeah, like and Capri, a lot in it, it's crazy. It's like yeah. dance fighting, but that's like a legit like yeah. and you're just like, this is amazing. So yeah. it's something different. Try to stay creative and learn while this whole COVID thing happens. But awesome. you being part of this is just icing on the cake. It's awesome. Awesome. Thanks, George.